this particular weekend seminar is devoted to Buddhism and it should be said first that there is a sense in which Buddhism is Hinduism stripped for export. Last week when I discussed Hinduism, I discussed many things to do with the organization of Hindu society because Hinduism is not merely what we call a religion, it's a whole culture. It's a legal system, it's a social system, it's a system of etiquette, and it includes everything. It includes housing, it includes food, it includes art, because the Hindus and many other ancient peoples do not make, as we do, a division between religion and everything else. Religion is not a department of life. It is something that enters into the whole of it. But you see, when a religion and a culture are inseparable, it's very difficult to export a culture because it comes into conflict with the established traditions, manners and customs of other people. So the question arises, what are the essentials that could be exported. And when you answer that, approximately, you'll get Buddhism. As I explained, the essential of Hinduism, the real deep root, isn't any kind of doctrine. It isn't really any special kind of discipline, although, of course, disciplines are involved. The center of Hinduism is an experience called moksha, liberation, in which through the dissipation of the illusion that each man and each woman is a separate thing in a world consisting of nothing but a collection of separate things, you discover that you are on one level an illusion, but on another level you are what they call the self, the one self, which is all that there is. The universe is the game of the self, which plays hide and seek forever and ever. When it plays hide, it plays it so well hides so cleverly that it pretends to be all of us and all things whatsoever and we don't know it because it's playing hide. But when it plays seek, it enters onto a path of yoga and through following this path, it wakes up and the scales fall from one's eyes. Now, in just the same way, the center of Buddhism, and the only really important thing about Buddhism is the experience which they call awakening. Buddha is a title and not a proper name. It comes from a Sanskrit root, Buddha. And that sometimes means to know, but better, waking. And so you get from this root, bodhi, that is the state of being awakened. And so Buddha the awakened one awakened person. And so there can, of course, in Buddhist ideas, be very many Buddhas. The person called the Buddha is only one of myriads. Because they, like the Hindus, are quite sure that our world is only one among billions. 
and that Buddhas come and go in all the worlds. But sometimes, you see, there comes into the world what you might call a big Buddha, a very important one. And such a one is said to have been Gotama, the son of a prince living in northern India, in the part of the world we now call Nepal, living shortly after 600 BC. All dates in Indian history are vague, and so I never try to get you to remember any precise date, like 564, which some people think it was. But just after 600 BC is probably right. Most of you, I'm sure, know the story of his life. But the point is that when in India a man was called a Buddha or the Buddha, this is a title of a very exalted nature. It is first of all necessary for a Buddha to be human. He can't be any other kind of being whether in the Hindu uh, scale of beings he's above the human state or below it. He is superior to all gods because according to Indian ideas, gods and angels, or angels would probably be a better name for them than gods, all those exalted beings are still in the wheel of becoming, still in the chains of karma, that is action, which requires the need for more action to complete it, and goes on requiring the need for more action. They are still, according to popular ideas, going round the wheel from life after life after life after life because they still have the thirst for existence or to put it in a Hindu way in them the self is still playing the game of not being itself but the Buddha's doctrine based on his own experience of awakening which occurred after seven years of attempts to study with the various yogis of the time, all of whom used the method of extreme asceticism, fasting, doing all sorts of exercises, lying on beds of nails, sleeping on broken rocks, any kind of thing to break down egocentricity, to become unselfish, to become detached, to exterminate desire for life. But Buddha found that all that was futile. That was not the way. And one day he broke his ascetic discipline and accepted a bowl of some kind of milk soup from a girl who was looking after cattle. And suddenly, in this tremendous relaxation, he went and sat down under a tree, and the burden lifted. He saw completely that what he had been doing was on the wrong track. You can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. And no amount of effort will make a person who believes himself to be an ego be really unselfish. So long as you think and feel that you are a somewhat contained in your bag of skin, and that's all, there is no way whatsoever of your behaving unselfish. Oh yes, you can imitate unselfishness. You can go through all sorts of highly refined 
are forms of selfishness, but you're still tied to the wheel of becoming by the golden chains of your good deeds, as the obviously bad people are tied to it by the iron chains of their misbehaviors. You know how people are when they get spiritually proud. They belong to some kind of a church group or an occult group and say, we are the ones who have, of course, the right teaching. We're the in-group, we are the elect, and everybody else outside is uh, really off the track. But then comes along someone who one-ups them by saying, well, in our circles, we are very tolerant, and we accept all religions and all ways as leading to the one. But what they're doing is they are playing the game called, we are more tolerant than you are. You see, and in this way, the egocentric being is always in his own trap. So Buddha saw that all his yoga exercises and ascetic disciplines had just been ways of trying to get himself out of the trap in order to save his own skin, in order to find peace for himself. And he realized that that is an impossible thing to do because the motivation ruins the project. He found out then, you see, that there was no trap to get out of except himself. Trap and trapped are one. And when you understand that, there isn't any trap left. I'm going to explain that, of course, more carefully. So as a result of this experience, he formulated what he calls the Dharma, that is the Sanskrit word for method. You will get a certain confusion when you read books on Buddhism because they switch between Sanskrit and Pali words. The earliest Buddhist scriptures that we know of are written in the Pali language and Pali is a softened form of Sanskrit. So that, for example, whereas the doctrine of the Buddha is called in Sanskrit the Dharma, but in Pali, and in many books of Buddhism, you'll find the Buddha's doctrine described as the Dhamma. And so in the same way, Karma, in Sanskrit, becomes in Pali, Kama. The Dharma, then, is the method. Now, the method of Buddhism, and this is absolutely important to remember, is dialectic. That is to say, it doesn't teach a doctrine. You cannot find anywhere what Buddhism teaches as you can find out what Christianity or Judaism or Islam teaches. Because all Buddhism is a discourse. And what most people suppose to be its teachings are only the opening stages of the dialogue. So, the concern of Buddha as a young man, the problem he wanted to solve, was the problem of human suffering. And so, he formulated his teaching in a very easy way to remember. Uh, all those Buddhist scriptures are full of what you might call mnemonic tricks, numbering things in such a way that they're easy to remember. And so, he proposed, he summed up his teaching in the form of what are called the Four Noble Truths. And the first one, which, because it was his main concern, was the truth about dukkha. Dukkha, suffering, 
pain, frustration, chronic dis-ease. It is the opposite of sukha, which means sweet, pleasure, etc. So, insofar as the problem posed in Buddhism is dukkha, I don't want to suffer and I want to find someone or something that can cure me of suffering. That's the problem. Now, then if there's a person who solved the problem, a Buddha, people come to him and say, Master, how do we get out of this problem? So what he does is to propose certain things. First of all, he points out that with dukkha go two other things. These are respectively called Anitya, Anitya, and Anatman. Anitya means a Nitya, Nitya means permanent. So impermanence, flux, change is characteristic of everything whatsoever. There isn't anything at all in the whole world, in the material world, in the psychic world, in the spiritual world, there is nothing you can catch hold of and hang on to for safety. Nothing. Not only is there nothing you can hang on to, but by the teaching of Anatman, there is no you to hang on to it. In other words, all clinging to life is an illusory hand grasping at smoke. If you can get that into your head and see that that is so, nobody needs to tell you that you ought not to grasp. Because you see, you can't. See, Buddhism is not essentially moralistic. The moralist is the person who tells people that they ought to be unselfish when they still feel like ego. And his efforts are always and invariably futile. Because what happens is he simply sweeps the dust under the carpet and uh, comes back again somehow. But in this case, it involves a realization that this is the case. So that's what the teacher puts across to begin with. The next thing that comes up, the second of the noble truths, is about the cause of suffering. And this in Sanskrit is called Krishna. Krishna is related to our word thirst. It's very often translated desire. That will do. Better perhaps is craving, clinging, grasping, or even to use our modern psychological word, blocking. When, for example, somebody is blocked and dithers and hesitates and doesn't know what to do, he is in the strictest Buddhist sense attached. He's stuck. But a Buddha can't be stuck. He cannot be phased. He always flows, just as water always flows, even if you dam it. The river just keeps on getting higher and higher and higher until it flows over the dam. It's unstoppable. Now, Buddha said then, Dukkha comes from Krishna. 
You all suffer because you cling to the world. And you don't recognize that the world is anitya and anatma. So then, try, if you can, not to grasp. Well, do you see that that immediately poses a problem? Because the student who has started off this dialogue with the Buddha <laughs> then makes various efforts to give up desire. Upon which he very rapidly discovers that he is desiring not to desire. And he takes that back to the teacher, who says, well, well, well. He said, of course, you are desiring not to desire, and that's, of course, excessive. All I want you to do is to give up desiring as much as you can. Don't want to go beyond the point. For this reason, Buddhism is called the middle way. Not only is it the middle way between the extremes of ascetic discipline and pleasure seeking, but it's also the middle way in a very subtle sense. Yes, don't desire to give up more desire than you and if you find that a problem, don't desire to be successful in giving up more desire than you can. You see what's happening? At every time he's returned to the middle way, he is moved out of an extreme situation. Now then, we'll go on, we'll cut out what happens in the pursuit of that method until a little later. The next truth in the list is concerned with the, the nature of release from dukkha. And so number three is nirvana. Nirvana is the goal of Buddhism. It's the state of liberation corresponding to what the Hindus call moksha. The word means blow out. Ni, and it comes from the root ni vritti. Now, some people think that what it means is blowing out the flame of desire. I don't believe this. I believe that it means breathe out rather than blow out. Because if you try to hold your breath, and in, in Indian thought, prana, breath, is the life principle. If you try to hold on to life, you lose it. You can't hold your breath and stay alive. It becomes extremely uncomfortable to hold on to your breath. And so in exactly the same way, it becomes extremely uncomfortable to spend all your time holding on to life. What the devil is the point of surviving, going on living, when it's a drag? But you see, that's what people do. They spend enormous efforts on maintaining a certain standard of living, which is a great deal of trouble. You know, you get a nice house in the suburbs, and the first thing you do is you plant a lawn. You've got to get out and mow the dam and you buy uh, expensive this, that, and soon you're all involved in mortgages, and instead of uh, being able to walk out in the garden and enjoy it, you sit at your desk looking at all the books and filling out this, that, and the other, and paying bills and answering letters. What, what a modern rot. But you see, that is holding on to life. So, translated into colloquial American, nirvana is 
Because <laughs> if you let your breath go, it'll come back. So nirvana is not annihilation. It's not disappearance into a sort of undifferentiated void. Nirvana is the state of being let go. It is a state of consciousness and a state of, you might call it, being here and now in this life. 